My dear respected brothers and sisters, I wanted to talk to you today about the importance of education. The reason is that during the past six or seven months during the lockdown, many of us have maybe realized if you had children at home, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, grandchildren who are going to school and they were on the lockdown, you must have realized what an enormous job it is to teach children. And credit to the teachers, credit to the teachers, to their patience, their diligence, their endurance, their discipline, their grit, their humility, credit to the teachers because they are walking in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim said to his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha that he is mu'alliman wa muyassira that he is a mu'allim, a teacher who makes things easy, muyassira the importance of education is manifest throughout the Quran and the Sunnah starting from the very first word that was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Iqra, recite, study, learn, read all the way to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to say Qur Rabbi zidni ilma and you have nowhere in the Qur'an as Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani rahimullahu ta'ala mentions you have nowhere in the Qur'an anywhere that Allah requests from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make this specific dua Rabbi zidni for anything else other than ilma knowledge Oh Allah increase me in knowledge no way you will have Rabbi zidni mala Rabbi zidni awlada that doesn't exist in the Quran it is Rabbi zidni ilma we know from the authentic hadith that whoever is on the path to seek beneficial knowledge that Allah makes that path to Jannah easy for that person and in some narrations of the hadith that everything makes dhikr and istighfar for the student of knowledge talibul ilm even the fish in the sea we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the noble Quran wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'lamuna shay'a that Allah has has brought you out of the wombs of your mothers while you knew nothing. And then the ayah goes on where Allah said, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to hear hearing and sight 
and also intellect. So perhaps that you thank Allah, that you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. Oh Allah, protect me from knowledge that is of no benefit. And on the reverse, he started his day with the famous dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'a. Oh Allah, I ask you, I ask you for beneficial knowledge on this day. Wa rizqun tayyiba wa amala mutaqabbala. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about those who know and those who have faith. Basically, they've coupled iman and knowledge. Ya rafa'illahu alladheena amanu minkum wa alladheena utu l'ilma darajat. Allah raises those amongst you who have faith and who have the gift of knowledge. Darajat, Allah raises them steps upon steps, ranks upon ranks upon ranks in the dunya and in the akhirah. My dear brothers and sisters, to even have a topic to speak about the importance of education, I feel embarrassed that I have to do that. <coughs> this is so manifest in the Quran and the Sunnah, and I'm looking here at knowledge generally. I don't like if someone says this is Islamic knowledge and this is secular knowledge. All knowledge is from Allah. And we are looking for beneficial knowledge. That is our distinction. Beneficial knowledge, non-beneficial knowledge. Oh Allah, I'm asking you for beneficial knowledge and protect me from non-beneficial knowledge. And if you do it with the right intention, then everything, maths, literacy, science, geography, history, everything is beneficial as long as you do it for the sake of Allah. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read, recite in the name of Allah who has created you. With that intention, bring me closer to you with that knowledge, Ya Allah. Well, I shak, and there is absolutely no doubt that right at the top of the knowledge pyramid is Al Quran Al Karim, Kalamullah. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you study it, memorize it, in Implement it in your life. That is the type and the kind of knowledge that brings you closest to Allah. Hence, it is the most beneficial of all types of knowledge. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, after this introduction, I like to go to a different topic, which is not the importance of knowledge, but who is teaching that knowledge? Where are we taking the knowledge from? And I'm saying that looking at our children looking at our children this is my main concern and i've been working in education for 12 years now in this country here my dear brothers and sisters on one side i am happy because we have a blessing in this country that most western countries don't have and i'm looking at central europe i'm looking at switzerland where i grew up we don't have these kind of Muslim schools, madrasas, masajid, activities. But on the other hand, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm looking at the generation to come. And I feel that the trajectory is going down. The himma, the importance that we give to Islamic education specifically in our ummah is going down. Many of the youngsters don't pay as much attention to that anymore. And who can blame them, my dear brothers and sisters? Who can blame them? I made the maths. A child in this country starts education at the age of three. And many of the youngsters, even most of the youngsters, stay in education up to the age of 23 university. I'm not even talking about postgrad, masters and PhD and whatnot. 20 solid years of someone educating your children. <coughs> someone educating your children. It is a fact that the teacher will spend in most cases and most families more time with your children than you as a father. That's a fact. And I'm saying again, the Tarubia the responsibility of Tarabiyah, my dear brothers and sisters, is on you, on me, 
as parents, as brothers, as sisters, as grandparents, uncles, aunties. You have the responsibility to protect yourself and your family from the hellfire. You. And if you choose to outsource some of that responsibility of tarbiyah, of nurturing and educating your children, if you outsource some of that, then you better choose very, very well where you outsource it to. Who do you let your children to be educated by? The first generations from the golden period of Islam, from the period of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the tabi'een, the atba tabi'een, and the salafu salihin min ba'dihim, they used to be very, very, very selective when they choose their, not mu'allim, murabbi, the person who nurtures their children. If you don't take this and you are busy with something else, and you outsource it to someone else, you better choose who that person is. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm not bashing teachers here. Muslims are not Muslims. All of them, most of them, most of them have the best intentions when they educate your children. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in education. And I'm saying here, Muslims and non-Muslims, they want the very best for your children. It takes a lot to be a teacher and qualifications, and study, and, 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 patience, and diligence, and sabr, and all of it. They want the best for your children. My question, however, is, who defines what is the best? Who defines that? What may be the best for them, may not be the best for me. And what I deem to be the best, maybe they don't agree. Have you ever thought about that? My dear brothers and sisters, we are talking about change of policy about RSE, relationship and sex education and, and, and we're making a big fuss and sometimes rightly so, sometimes, sometimes. But I want you to pay attention to something that is even a bigger, even a bigger danger than someone teaching our children RSE, which is the ideology, the philosophy that is given to our children over 20 years of education. How are they turning up? Why do we have Hafaz of Quran al Karim by the age of 12? By the age of 15, they have knocking on my door saying, I don't believe in the Quran. I don't believe in Allah. This and that. And that's not again, it's not one, not two, not three. Why do I have fathers calling me? Speak to my daughter about hijab. Why do we have that? My dear brothers and sisters, we need to take this responsibility with an utmost urgency. And we need to pay more attention. And again, I'm saying, I'm not advocating here for any uh, revolt or anything like that. A'uzu billah. I'm not saying it is haram, this and that. You know your situation. But I want to raise the awareness, my dear brothers and sisters, that the responsibility of Tarbiya is in your place, in your house. You will be asked for that on the Day of Judgment. And you better pay attention to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to give proper Tarbiya to our children to our grandchildren and whoever is in our care. Barakallahu lana wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa naf'ana wa iyyakum bil ayati wa zikri al-Hakim aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'iri al-Muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu hubla ghafuru rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ولا عاقبة للمتقين وصل اللهم وسلم وزد وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد. My dear brothers and sisters, the first part of this khutbah was about the importance of education and about the importance of tarbiyah. Islamic education, Islamic upbringing, Islamic nurturing. We have chosen to live in this country. We may, بإذن الله تعالى, be able to protect ourselves. Perhaps we are able to protect our children. But it was your choice to be here. What will happen to your grandchildren 
and their children, and so on. Ask yourself about that. Now, I'm not saying homeschooling is the way to go. I'm not saying this or that way is to go. If everyone is done properly, there is a reason and there is an argument for it. Me personally, I'm a huge advocate of independent Islamic schools. And I know what you're going to say. I know that you will say the quality of education in those schools is not where it should be. And I will agree, for the most part, private, independent Muslim schools are not yet where we should be. But I want you to know that it is our responsibility to bring them to that level. And I can report you as someone who has worked for 12 years in such a school or different schools like that, someone who has been in the system, I can report to you that Muslim, private Muslim schools are categorically underfunded. Categorically. Categorically, we work at about half the budget what a child gets from the what the school gets from the government to cheat to teach your children at the government school, a maintained school. About half the budget, approximately. It is our responsibility to take care of our institutions. And it's not just about finance. I know that every single teacher in a Muslim, private Muslim school today, every one of them is sacrificing a lot. I worked as a teacher and for the past six or seven years I worked in management. Every single teacher in a school is sacrificing. They could easily go down the road and earn almost double their salary. So next time we are bashing Muslim schools, think about that. Think about what you can do to improve that situation. My dear brothers and sisters, I am ashamed to stand here in London where we say that we have over one million Muslims who say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and we cannot take care of our masajid and our Muslim schools. How is this even possible? I'm sorry to get loud. This is emotional to me. And I'm ashamed to say that. How is this even possible? How is it possible that we allow it to us, as an Ummah, to beg the government, the non-Muslim government, to say, please, finance our school. Make us an academy. Or we send a delegation to the Khalij and say, please give me some money, I need to run a Muslim school. One million Muslims just in London. I'm not even talking about the rest of the UK, Europe. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. How did we let this happen, my dear brothers and sisters? How? The time has come to an end. I've already over, overdone my time, my dear brothers. But I want you to take this matter serious, even if you don't have children. On the day of judgment, we will be asked, what did we do? to provide not a ghetto, not a bubble in which we want to teach our children, no. Did we provide a safe environment for our children? An environment where our children learn to stand upright, to live in this country here, to not be ashamed of who they are, to say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, as a person who is active in the community, for the community, Muslims and non-Muslims. That's where I want to be. That's where I want our institutions to be. And I leave you with this hadith, which was narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانُ إِنْ قَطَعْ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ Allahu Akbar. When a man dies, his acts come to an end. In Qatar, basically that's it. In Fasr, there's no more reward. Nothing you can do. You can do nothing anymore. That's it. You're in the grave. But the hadith goes on. Illa min thalath, except for three. If you've done three things in your life, 
the reward for those actions will be ongoing until the day of judgment. What are they? Except if you left behind a sadaqa, an ongoing sadaqa, an ongoing charity, something that is ongoing. You build a masjid, you contributed to some cause, an Islamic cause, something, a well, something that is ongoing. That's one. Or you left behind some knowledge that people can benefit from. Maybe you wrote a book, maybe you financed for a book to be published, something like that. A video, da'wah, in any kind, form. Or a righteous child that you left behind who is going to make dua for you. And I want you to leave today's Juma with this thought. If you invest your money or your time or your expertise in any way or form or shape into a Muslim school, a private independent Muslim school, you have done all three of those. Sadaqatun Jariya and Ilmun Yuntafaw Bih and you have invested in children that may make dua for you. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa gives us tawfiq to take care of our institutions and our masajid and our schools. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us inshallah to leave the next generation a shakhsiya muslima qawiyya with a strong muslim personality with a sense of not pride, not arrogance but sense of humility and a sense of ownership and our responsibility. Not ashamed to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I pray that we can become strong to the point that we can do some change for good for everyone. My dear brothers and sisters, if you don't take this responsibility serious, I pray that we will not end up like our brothers and sisters in China. May Allah subhanahu help our brothers and sisters in China. And may Allah subhanahu help them and us to raise the awareness about what is happening in China right now. May Allah subhanahu help us all. وأكثر من الصلاة والسلام على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم فإن من صلى على نبيه مرة واحدة صلى الله عليه بها عشرة اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد اللهم ارزقنا محبته وإتلاعه ظاهرا وباطنا اللهم توفنا على ملته اللهم احشرنا في ذمته اللهم اسقنا من حوده اللهم ادخلنا في شفاعته اللهم اجمعنا به في جنات النعيم مع الذين أنعمت عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين اللهم ارضى عن خلفائه الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي أفضل أتباء المرسلين اللهم ارضى عن الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم ارضى عنا ما هم بمنك وكرمك يا رب العالمين اللهم انصحوا لا تمور المسلمين اللهم انصر المستدعفين من المسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا وأخواتنا المستدعفين في الصين وفي كشمير وفي سوريا وفي فلسطين وفي اليمن وفي كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم اصلح المسلمين جميعا ذكورهم وإناثهم كبارهم وصغارهم يا رب العالمين ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاصرين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعد والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون فذكر الله العظيم الجليل يذكركم واشكروه على نيمه يزدكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون ما قيم الصنع خصك الرحمن بالفضل والتيجان والروح والريحان يا حامل القرآن قد خصك الرحمن بالفضل والتيجان